Yeah, that, and then also can you just put some waters and just place them next to the main pad? Oh, right down the other side. These waters here? Yeah. Just grab, um, kind of place them in front of the side. Right Thumbs up for the president, so whenever he begins, when he can not start to get them down there. Take your seats. So for the record, we are officially 10 minutes behind, and we just got started. So I call the first session of the 44th Annual Conference of the Enlisted Association of the National Guard of the United States to order. I'm pleased to introduce Chaplain Sergeant First Class Retired Joe Wade, who will present the invocation. Can we stand, please? Let's bow for a few moments of silence. Let's remember those that ultimate sacrifice protecting our freedoms. And let's remember those English members for a few moments of silence. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this enlisted association and the auxiliary, and we just pray for our elected leaders, our delegates, our guest speakers, and all in attendance. We just pray for our soldiers and airmen that are deployed around the world. We just pray that you'll protect them and bring them home safely. We just uh, May we always remember to give you the praise, honor, and glory for everything that's accomplished. Thank you for giving us safe travel to this location. Just go with us now. Give us a good conference and these things we ask in Christ's name. Thank you. Amen. All right. Please remain standing for the posting of the colors by Indiana Joint Honor Guard. The singing of the national anthem by Sergeant Leanne Bowes and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Angus Auxiliary President Judy Wood and the placement of the Memorial Book.
No color guard? No, we have a wonderful color guard. Someone took their flag out of the storage area and took it somewhere. We're trying to find it. We don't have an American flag that's suitable for presentation. Bryce, how much is that going to cost me? A lot. Well, y'all have a seat. Doug. All right. I'm pretty sure Doug did that on purpose. I told you I wouldn't hide anything in your I'm, script. I'm waiting to see what he put in the script. All right, so if everyone would please stand. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the rest parts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. President. Sergeant Arms. We have two distinguished guests in the chamber. From Indiana's 7th Congressional District, the Honorable Andre Carson and the Adjutant General of Indiana, Major General Courtney Carr. Please escort our distinguished guests to the podium. Good afternoon and welcome to Indiana. It is my great honor to welcome you to the 44th conference of the uh, Enlisted Association of the National Guard of the United States. I will tell you that uh, in my 30 plus years, I can think back to many critical points in my career where the NCOs mentored and taught me and brought me along uh, to help me be the leader that, uh, that I've had the honor to be. And it's really what differentiates the United States military from other countries is our professional NCO Corps. And so many of you have uh, state partnerships, and you can see our state partners now working on NCO development and developing a professional NCO Corps because the United States really sets the standard uh, for that capability and that professionalism. And it's you all that are the backbone uh, of the Army uh, and that set the foundation uh, for our leadership. And I'm particularly uh, uh, the benefactor of that uh, leadership and mentorship throughout the years. For all officers, NCOs, uh, it's really uh, young captains. I can remember as a, as a young lieutenant, uh, that first sergeant, you know, grabbed the lieutenant and uh, uh, taught him what to do. And so it's the NCOs that, uh, through their professionalism and dedication, that, that nurture and develop the officer corps. Superiors, peers, subordinates, uh, and this association really is the, the voice of that professionalism. And it's essential that we're able to uh, make that voice heard. Your voice is critical. This association, the national associations, do so much for our military service and for the Army and Air, specifically for the National Guard. What we're about, the roles we perform, uh, the missions, uh, and, our, and our needs. It's the association's voice uh, that, that communicates that uh, to Washington. So on behalf of Governor Mike Pence, my boss, uh, the 50th governor of the state of Indiana, uh, it's a great honor for me to welcome you to this conference. Enjoy yourself. Indiana Indianapolis is a wonderful city, uh, the, the race capital of the world. Uh, and enjoy yourself here, uh, spend lots of money, uh, help our economy. Uh, but it is, you'll enjoy it here, it's a great city. So now, uh, I talked about uh, the importance of the association in making uh, our voices heard in Washington. And we're very fortunate here 
to have our own congressman from right here uh, in the capital uh, of Indiana, the heartland of uh, America, our congressman, Congressman uh, Andre Carson. And he represents the district here in uh, Indianapolis. He's an Indianapolis native, influential leader, respected public servant. He's authored three pieces of legislation that have directly benefited uh, uh, service members and veterans. And I will tell you, he's been a great friend to Indiana, uh, to the Indiana Guard. The Service Members Mental Health Screening Act ensures a more holistic evaluation of mental health assessments before and after deployment. The Military Families Financial Preparedness Act provides service members and their spouses with financial counseling uh, before leaving the military. And the Military Suicide Reduction Act provides mid-deployment mental health assessments to service members uh, deployed to combat. And I'll tell you, I just finished this weekend uh, our uh, Indiana's Star Survivor Outreach uh, Weekend. And I will tell you that uh, these pieces of legislation benefit our soldiers and airmen. Uh, we're so blessed to have Congressman Carson's leadership in Washington. Prior to serving uh, Hoosiers at the national level, Representative Carson worked full time in law enforcement and at the uh, Indiana Department of Homeland Security. I've met Congressman Carson several times. He's a great supporter, provides great mentorship and advice, helps steer us in the right direction, but keeps an open ear uh, to find out what our needs are. And so, sir, it's our great honor to have you here yes, sir. Uh, at the Enlisted Association of the United States. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce you to this great crowd. What an honor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me this afternoon. I appreciate the very warm welcome. General Carr, Indiana's new adjutant general, for his very kind words. And after all that General Ombarga did for our state, uh, he has big shoes to fill, but I'm confident that he's going to make his own mark, and he's already doing it quite well. There's a lot of buzz right now in uh, our, our, our state, but also our, our communities about his vision for uh, taking us into the future. So we appreciate him. I had a chance to sit down with him recently, and we had a robust discussion about keeping our state safer, keeping our country safer, and uh, a larger discussion about more uh, diversity and the inclusion of women. To General Grass, the Chief of our National Guard Bureau, thank you for making the trip to the great Hoosier State. I hope you enjoy our city and we appreciate your leadership. To Command Sergeant uh, Jim Gordon, we want to thank you too. And especially I want to thank all of you, the enlisted men and women of our National Guard. Uh, my grandfather was a Marine, uncle was a Marine, I have cousins who served in our armed services and the National Guard. You know, for more than a decade, all of you have been carrying a heavy weight for our country. You've not only developed or deployed multiple times to Iraq and Afghanistan, but you have stood prepared to respond when disaster strikes here at home. You've taken the fight to our adversaries. You've offered support where needed and taken the lead when called. After more than a decade of war, our National Guard is an operational force. And it is the responsibility of your elected officials to ensure that it stays that way. Now, I strongly believe that in strength reductions to the Guard should be based on mission requirements, not some arbitrary pursuit of parity between the active and reserve components. I strongly believe that, that that is why we need to let the Commission on the Future of the Army complete its great work before any major changes are made. As we discuss the composition of our force, we cannot lose sight of what our people need. 
The Guard recruits men and women who know that a few years of military service can set them on the path toward a promising career in civilian life. To ensure that the Guard continues to attract our best and brightest, they need to know that when they enlist, that they will be taken care of, both while in service and when they return to civilian life. That is why we fought so very hard for more comprehensive mental health programs, including mid-deployment mental health assessments. We have to protect educational benefits and provide robust family support. We need to give those protecting our country pay raises that they so desperately deserve. Our National Guard is very critical in protecting our country. It's made up of men and women who are dedicated to our national security. You aren't just backup or support. You are a well-trained, well-equipped complement to the active component. Time and time again, our nation has relied on you, both home and abroad, and each time you have surpassed every expectation. So I want to thank you for putting together this tremendous event and giving me a chance to say a few words and know that you have a friend in Congress who's working on the Intelligence Committee and helping to provide resources for you as you keep our country and our international communities safer. Thank you and God bless. God bless America. Thank you. Sergeant Arms, can we have them escorted away? <laughs> All right. Sergeant in Arms. Mr. President, we have two distinguished guests in the chamber, the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, General Frank J. Grass, and the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, Chief Master Sergeant Mitchell O. Brush. Please escort our distinguished guests to the podium. So uh, I would like to introduce Chief Master Sergeant Brush, who advises the Chief of the National Guard Bureau on all enlisted matters affecting training, effective utilization, health of the force, and enlisted professional development. Is the Chief on? Hello, check, mic check, is that better? There we go, got some power. Hey, what a great opportunity for us to spend some time here. Um, I just got a little history lesson before I walked in. Um, come to find out that there's a monument that's in the center of town, and it's the second freestanding monument uh, right next to the Washington Monument, and the best part about it is that it's, uh, it was built by veterans, solely by veterans. And if you get a chance to take it, the monument itself, it's got four different pictures on each side of it. it talks about getting ready to go to war, going to war, fighting the war, and then returning back to our communities. Um, so for the professional development individuals that are here today, if you get a chance to see it, it's a constant reminder of why we exist and the things that we do. So I get an opportunity today to not only talk about the National Guard, my favorite thing, but I get a chance to introduce my boss, your chief of the National Guard Bureau. Uh, General Grass, Missouri Guardsman, one of the questions he always asks whenever he gets a chance to meet somebody is what state are you from? And so with that, uh, we're going to kind of tag team a little bit today, and we'll talk about our organization, where we're at today, and where we're going to go to. So please welcome our Chief of the National Guard Bureau. All right, am I up? Can you hear me all right? 
All right, we're on. Well, it is a great opportunity to be here. Uh, another drill weekend for me. Uh, I always tell the staff, I gotta be out on drill weekends, but never pay me or I'm going to jail because we get paid full time to do this. Can you imagine they let us do this full time and they pay us for these jobs? It is a great opportunity uh, coming up on three years as your chief. And I will tell you that this National Guard is the best I've ever seen in my 46 years almost that I've served. And uh, the best thing we get to do, Chief and I, is to get out and see the men and women of the National Guard. Yesterday, I was in Illinois, Springfield, and, and watched the change out of the uh, retirement for the outgoing adjutant general. But I had a chance to meet and do a town hall with the Illinois National Guard and a meeting with the leadership. Uh, last weekend, we were in Virgin Islands, change out of the adjutant general, uh, town hall with the guardsmen. Went over to Puerto Rico, saw guardsmen that are getting ready to deploy on their final uh, pre-deployment training. Uh, across the board, again, I just can't say enough good things about the National Guard, and it is exactly what the nation needs right now, is a strong National Guard. Chief and I kind of tag team this, so we're running through a few slides here. Chief, I'll turn it over to you to start off. Perfect, forget the first slide, please. So it's important for us as an organization we talk about membership within our professional organizations, and I hate to say it, but we're all members here, right? So where does our membership come from? It comes from the field. And it's important for us to talk about the organization so we can understand better, we can better explain, because, you know, we've got young individuals out there, and they're not willing to give $36 a year to something that's not going to give them any return. So here's who we are. And it's a good snapshot of where we stand. So General Grass, as you guys know, is the second four-star chief of the National Guard Bureau. The first was General McKinley, guardsman from Florida. But if you get a chance to see how we're organized, you see that you have a three-star director of the Air National Guard, General Calvary, and his command sergeant major is Brunt Conley, sitting right back there. Next to him is the director, of the th three-star director on the Air National Guard side, who is General Clark, and Chief Jim Hotelling is your guys' command chief on the Air National Guard. Those three stars report directly to our chief of the National Guard Bureau. And you guys see where it sits, and it's purple. Why is it purple? Because it's a joint position. General Grass, the chief can be either green or blue. Thank goodness he's green because he makes me blue and I'm here. <laughs> Interesting part about this is that he sits at the same level of the chief of staff of the Army, who is now General Milley. And his command sergeant major of the SMA of the Army is Dan Daly, command sergeant major Dan Daly. On the left-hand side, secretary of the Air Force, chief of staff of the Air Force, General Mark Welsh, and the chief master sergeant of the Air Force is Jim Cody. So you see how we sit and we have postured. That didn't happen by chance. It wasn't an accidental choice. This happened because of the reputation of the people that we have in this room. All the hard work that our airmen and soldiers do every single day, 15,000 of them which makes our force of 455,000 strong. But there's one block that's missing between the Chief of Staff, the Army Chief of Staff, the Air Force. We don't have that other block right there. Who's our Secretary? Our Secretary is the Secretary of Defense. General Grass reports directly to the Secretary of Defense. That's unique to us. That's really important. The Secretary of Defense needs to know all matters in the homeland, and he is the resident expert right there. We work every single day to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and his senior enlisted advisor. That's our first point of attack on Capitol Hill. If we need to change policy, we need to fix things that are wrong, that are inherently guard, we get to go through our Chief of the National Guard Bureau. First channel. Second channel, our National Guard units out in the state, they report directly to their 54 adjutants generals, who report directly to their commander in chief, who is their governor, right? President Obama started a council of governors. Our governors report directly to the president. That's our second point of attack. Our third point of attack on Capitol Hill, can anybody tell me what that is? Say us, that's right. It's our professional organizations. For the whole price of $36, I got somebody that can carry my water to Capitol Hill. This is who we are. Hey, thanks, Chief. Uh, one of the things I wanted to share off this slide with you, and I get this asked quite a bit, is do you feel like you're a full member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff? And, and I think Chief's laid it out pretty well in the structure and how it works. Uh, I've been through three secretaries of defense. So I don't know if that's a reflection <laughs> on me or what. And I've only been in three years, but I've worked for three secretaries of defense so far. But because of the great work and the grassroots power of the National Guard, uh, you know, we were elevated. General McKinley was elevated to a member of the JCS, Joint Chiefs of Staff, seven members. 
And uh, Joe McKinley talked with us for a while, uh, me and Joe Lingell, when I, when I came in, we spent some time. He said, hey, here are the things you need to deal with, what you need to think about. Because he had about six, eight months from the time that he was con you know, confirmed as a member of the JCS until he uh, handed it over to me. And uh, my first thought was, I got to bring value to this position. You know, why did the men and women of the National Guard and the associations push to have the chief elevated, first of all, to a four star, but then to a member of the JCS? And I realized at that point it was to have your voices heard. And I work for you. When a new tag comes in, I will call them and I tell them, I work for you. There's no reason for us to exist in Washington if it wasn't for you. So being on the JCS, my job is to tell your story. And what I've found in three years now, when it comes to the non-federalized National Guard, the accessibility I get to the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman, sometimes the President, uh, is, is just off the scale. Uh, two weeks ago, spent uh, six hours with Secretary Carter talking about the 17 budget with all the COCOMs and the, the service secretaries and the other JCS members. We would have never had that opportunity to have that